data citation session this afternoon. Uh, for those of you that have just come in, we've had two short talks about different aspects of data citation and we're about to have two more short talks. Although this time both of the people who are speaking are actually the people who are in the program as opposed to before the break where we had two imposters who came in off the streets and <laughs> rambled on about data citation in an incoherent way. Um, the way we're going to do this is actually in all seriousness, if you didn't see the previous two talks, I encourage you to look at them when they load them on the website. Uh, so the way we'll do it is we'll do two fairly short presentations of about five minutes each and then we'll use the rest of the session for questions and answers uh, around the topic of data citation. Um, so the first presenter in this second half slot is Anne Stevenson from CIRO Information Management and Technology, IMT. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everybody. Um, okay. Oh, yes, okay, thanks. That's good. That bug my neck. All right, so you've heard from uh, a couple of speakers now about the data site and about the DOIs. You've heard about an implementation in the Australian Antarctic Division. In CSIR, I'm going to talk really specifically about DOIs and about what we're trying to encourage by the use of DOIs and what, how we're actually doing that. So we have um, some system-based implementation. We've got an automated process to deliver a DOI for a publicly available data set or a handle for a non-public data set, still a persistent identifier. We present an attribution statement within the collection description. It's visible to the depositor during the creation of the record. Changes can be made to the record during the deposit process and they're reflected in the attribution statement. So it's actually quite dynamic, visible to the user while they're depositing. It can be copied for use in publications and the final format is visible to the end user. So this is the attribution statement that the depositor can see. I've just highlighted the, the section that's relevant at the bottom. And in this case, what you can see is the format of a DOI at the bottom, the format of the attribution statement that will be available. What the end user will see is an attribution statement with that DOI embedded in it. We've aligned this fairly closely to Vancouver as a fairly generalist um, style, given that CSIRO is multidisciplinary and styles are often developed by um, journals, as well as, you know, we have the general science ones like Harvard. Um, and Vancouver and Chicago. So we also have in place, uh, um, I guess, a more people-oriented approach. Members of the Research Data Service are currently calling authors whose journal articles have recently been um, approved internally. So we have an internal approval process. It's, web, it's web-enabled. Um, we can run reports in it, which is actually a really big win factor. And um, when we're talking to people, apart from having to say we're from CSIRO's research data service because they're really not sure that that exists, um, we can almost hear the attention level increase when we mention DOIs. So it's certainly anecdotal evidence, but they get DOIs. And I'm channeling Natasha. I channel Natasha every time I talk about these. Um, and this is certainly, these calls are certainly part of an overall strategy to populate the repository, but the carrot is the citation of the data. Um, we run training sessions for depositing and managing data in, the, in, the, in our data access portal, in our DAP. Um, we include a demonstration about the attribu attribution statement. We include a demonstration about linking the data to your publication in our publications repository. And that's another thing that sort of gets people a bit buzzy. We've got a dedicated intranet section. It's very brief at the moment on citing data and we are pulling a little bit of information off the AND site without actually trying to replicate it completely. We're tapping into professional writing courses within CSIRO and that is generating significant interest. 
and um, that same process also runs a, um, an internal proposal preparation course that seems to be giving us some wins in awareness raising. Um, now we have a few plans in place because of course this is, sorry Karen, this is very early on in the process so um, it's baby steps but we will be distributing the ANS data citation leaflet, you know, I've got them in, um, in my library space up in Newcastle and we've distributed them around the place a little bit and they just, they're just starting to tweak interest. Um, and the other thing that I'm trying to do is to uh, collate a list of references to papers that talk about the evidence of the impact of um, and, and citation metrics. So, um, so although there's a lot of papers now on the benefits of sharing data, there are only very few it seems, at least to my knowledge, on the impact that uh, citing data is having. So oh, that'll be me. Um, stop, stop. Oh, okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, so, so we're starting to um, we're starting to see these papers come through, and so far they're very much discipline specific. So I think there's one in the biosciences, there's one in the geosciences, and there's one in astronomy at least. So obviously two scientific. Um, scientific centric if you like, but or science centric if you like, but that's our space. So, uh, but I am interested if anybody has any uh, references to articles that are uh, in any of the sciences, in any of the humanities, then I'm interested in knowing about it because we can curate this and collate it for the whole community. So, um, Oh, we've got um, a few collections in RDA that are DOI ready, so we'll be working on getting those down and we'll certainly be looking to track our citations via a few options. Impact Story, which would be readily available now. Uh, we know that Thomson Reuters are putting out, uh, have put out DCI and of course Google is another way perhaps that we can have a look at um, tracking citation usage. All right, just a few... Um, Quotes really, Natasha and Steve McKechn were talking up at uh, the data citation workshop in Brisbane. So there's stuff there that I really think is worth reinforcing. So I'll just leave that up without repeating it. Thank you. Thanks. Karen, if you'd like to come up. Um, while Karen's coming up, uh, just on the Thomson Reuters data citation index, uh, if you haven't yet seen it, they're running a series of webinars starting middle of this, well, in the middle of next month, middle of November onwards in a range of time zones. Um, next week. Next week it's starting already. Oh, okay. All right. The one I'm registered for is the... Okay. Well, all right. They're starting. Um, if you haven't seen them and signed up for them, I encourage you to do so. I think they're an hour, is that? Um, and this is the sort of the first public release of information about DCI and what it's trying to do. Let me now hand over to Karen Visser, who works for an amazing and wonderful organisation. Karen, take it away. I'll do this for you. Thank you. Okay. Those of you who have been following Heather Pivovar from the University of British Columbia's work will know that she said in 2012 that data citation metrics are not easy. Well, in the past year, we've managed um, to come quite some way in understanding a little bit more about data citation metrics. And I'd like to thank um, Griffith University Gold, Star Gold Standard Records for this beautiful example of um, a data citation that's in um, Research Data Australia. We've been hearing a lot about the Thomson Reuters um, Data Citation Index. And uh, ANS has been in constant contact with Thomson Reuters for some time regarding the development of this index. And we've met several times this year in, uh, about the best way of getting information into the index. Um, we've provided them with a RIFCS uh, crosswalk to populate the fields that they're looking for. <coughs> Excuse me. And at our last meeting, we discussed either uploading the aggregated set to their data citation index from Research Data Australia or arranging RIFCS harvests from the ANS partners to Thomson Reuters. And both of those scenarios would seem to have um, merit in their own way. 
a question has been asked about how would thomson reuters and ans manage the feeds from both the originating source and the ans without creating the ans research data australia without creating duplicates and we want to make it clear that ans wants to promote the originating source and provide via the aggregator ans when it's appropriate, easier, desired, and in such a way that it, it's possible to retain the profile and visibility of the originating sources. But Thomson Reuters is confident that they can work through this issue and will continue to work with them um, as their product refines and as, and as we move on. Some questions earlier on was about um, Scopus and Elsevier, and ANS have agreed to work together um, with Scopus for citation indexing. Um, ANS met with Scopus in Amsterdam month, last month and they're really keen for Elsevier to play an active role in data set discovery and data set, data set reference tracking. They want to work with ANS to run a proof of concept with ANS and the Australian market and are interested in developing a data citation metrics product because they now have a way to leverage their own infrastructure to play all their forward indicators confirm data as being an important area for scholarly communications. They've got confidence in the ANS brand and our joint ability to test the market. And DOIs allow data citation tracking in mega global systems. Uh, ANS and their Scopus Head of Product Management will meet again in Canberra in the um, week after next to further refine discussions. They're all example of bibliometrics but altmetrics may become increasingly important into the future, and ANS is interested in engaging in altmetrics as well. You might notice that 59,000 plus views are an example of altmetrics. Of interest here are the other altmetrics figures for Facebook and Twitter. But no, there are no citations, because this article with its 59,000 plus views was published just a month ago. Alt metrics are a way of identifying early interest and trends without the delay of formal scholarly publishing and their resultant citations, which can be months or sometimes even years. Whilst this is a journal example, the corollary holds for recently published data sets as well. Formal scholarly bibliometrics may not indicate impact for months, but alt metrics can begin to re record impact immediately. And Anne's ANS has a way of um, you being able to use it to share the impact of records using alt metrics and plans are underway possibly for further development in this area but if you click on the share there's many many ways of um, sharing using alt metrics. CSIRO have registered the um, data access portal with uh, Geoscience Data Journal as part of the Wiley Open Access Publishing program and they've been able to do this because they are, uh, they use DOIs um, and ANS is in discussion with Wiley Data Journals in Australia to ensure that data citations in Research Data Australia are in the form which can be cited and counted. So what are, what's ANS doing in terms of the, the community? We've got... Oops. Um, we've had um, a number of webinars and events and the recordings and discussions are all up on the ANS website and we've got projects with the Australian Antarctic Division, Australian Data Archive, CSIRO and Griffith University and we've got people from all of those projects here except um, Australian Data Archive, I think. So you can see the, the URL down the bottom there. On the 22nd of November is the annual RIFCS upgrade and it coincides with release 9 and there are two things of interest for those of you who are interested in data citation. The first one is there will be a basic view my DOIs page. So it's very basic but it allows um, anyone who's minting DOIs to keep track of them. You can also do that through data site. And the metadata elements have been changed to bring them into line with um, data site metadata schema version 2.2. And lastly, I'd encourage all of you to have to listen to the webinar recordings. We've had national as well as international speakers. Look at the work of others and engage with the data, site, uh, data citation community. 
There'll be lots more on DOIs next year and the data citation activities um, will probably include a DOIs, DOI Minters Monthly Virtual Meetup where we'll probably all get together for a month and just have roundtable discussions about um, DOIs where people are up to. So I look forward to all of your engagement next year. Thank you. Okay, questions for either presenter? Hi, it's a question from, for Anne. Uh, I'm Andrew, I work with Anne's in South Australia in particular, and very interested to hear what you're doing in Syro because I'm, I have concerns that the universities I work with don't possibly understand the commitment of the OIs and minting them, and I wondered if you could uh, share a few thoughts about how CSIRO is handling that and resourcing it. Uh, well, ANS is actually resourcing it. <laughs> um, certainly the DOI minting is um, a free service from ANS. I'm more interested in the ongoing maintenance of the DOIs and making sure they always they continue to point to the right place as your systems change and evolve. Okay, so that's actually um, incorporated really into the business rules that sit behind the DOI generation from the data access portal. Uh, there was a lot of pain, <laughs> I think it would be fair to say, uh, that went into the development of those business rules. So for example, um, if a, if a collection that has been published, uh, it, it, sorry, a collection that has been published cannot be edited. It can be updated and um, depending on the significance of the update, so for example, if it's a typo, it will not generate a DOI. These are part of the data site rules. Um, but if, if it's a significant upgrade, then it will um, result in a new version and um, bearing in mind that it's early days for us because this is uh, the DOI minting process is only recently being released in the last uh, July, yeah, in the last couple of months. Um, the, um, uh, the, I don't think we've seen an updated one yet, but there's certainly a process in place to manage that automagically. Terrific. Would you consider sharing your business rules with the community? Because I reckon some people... They're up on the ANS website. Oh, fabulous. I didn't know that. Thank you. I see. ANS people come to ANS to conferences to learn about other things that ANS staff are, staff are doing. Do it. <laughs> uh, hi, it's Natasha from Griffith. Um, thank you for those presentations. Um, I think we've come an enormous way in the past year, and I think it's worth keeping in mind that we're sort of at the cutting edge here of a global initiative and you know we're talking a lot about how to track citations with DOIs but we're still at the stage of really getting traction on implementing the DOIs to start with so I think it's it's fantastic um, that we're doing it and I think um, it, there's actually a lot if you haven't looked at DOIs it's actually good that there's been some guinea pigs go through this and there's just such a wonderful amount of information on the ANS website for this um, but I was wondering if you could talk, Karen, a bit about the ODIN project um, because Adrian mentioned the links between data site and ORCID and how that would look at data citation and tracking. Uh, so I know it's a very new project but if you've got anything that you can share on that because that's also part of this sort of uh, initiative as well. Um, I'm not able to speak on that but um, Andrew will be able to answer your question. So ODIN is the ORCID data site identifier. The N probably stands for network, but don't quote me on that. So this is a European Union Framework Program 7 funded project where ANS is one of the partners uh, being driven out of CERN, the High Energy Physics Centre in Switzerland, um, working with the British Library um, as registrars. Uh, and it's really working with CERN as generators of data and publications and ORCID as generator of author identifiers and looking at how you would tie those together. So the project, I'm not even sure the project's been officially announced, it certainly started activity. They might still be in the haggle phase with the European Union but uh, I don't think they've got a website yet but I'm expecting it any day now uh, and that's going to be something that we'll be uh, 
working with them on over the next year and a half or two years. Um, I'm sure we'll have an announcement on that web page and probably on the ANS mailing list once there's something we can point to. Okay. Guru. Karan and thanks for the presentation. Karan, I'm just curious to know why uh, Thomson Reuters Data Citation Index has to work with the individual organization instead of going to the data site, meta store, where all the devices are available. They can harvest that information and track the citation instead of working with the individual organization. Eventually, if I mint a DOI from ANTS uh, site my data, I can go and look at in the data site meta store whether oh. the DOI is available. So everybody, it's an aggregator, so why don't they work with the aggregator instead of working with each individual organization? Um, I'm not sure. Do we have somebody from Thomson Reuters here who might be able to answer that question? <laughs> That's one for our product management that I'll need to sort of follow up, but uh, yeah, I can't answer that question at this point. Yeah. The Australian parliamentary approach to that is we'll take that question on notice. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I hadn't thought of it. Uh, I'd be interested to hear the answer as well. Um, Andrew. Okay, it, it, we're technically over time, but yeah, we can make this the last question. Thanks. Uh, can we make that one live? Okay, go now. No, no, no. I'll meet you halfway. Excellent. I was just going to mention that one of the reasons may be because so many people aren't using DOIs at this point, because some of the major repositories are. I know that the um, Australian Data Archive isn't using DOIs, for example. So. Yeah. Um, my question actually was um, regarding uh, journals and their instructions to authors section and the instructions about citing data. So do you know if anyone's monitoring, uh, um, you know, the journals? I mean, there's a huge number of them, but perhaps by major publisher. I know it's normally an individual journal thing, so you can't necessarily you know, all of Bali and all of Elsevier it's certainly different. isn't doing it. But if you could push it through the publishers so that they're actually asking their journal editors to do it, can you uh, okay. mention? I'm, I'm happy to attempt an answer on that. Um, yeah, and I've got something I'd like to add to. Sure, thanks, Andrew. Um, okay, so we have um, possibly more than anecdotal evidence that there is at least one journal around that is saying uh, we will not accept a paper if data is cited in the references um, because in that case apparently data is not considered by that journal to be a first class object, a peer reviewed object I should say. Um, however, there are other very equally high, possibly higher impact journals that are um, saying that the data, the resources that provide input to the journal article must be made publicly available. Some of them specify where that might be and that's particularly the case in biosciences where you might have to put something in the gene expression omnibus. Um, but there are others who make um, a fairly generic statement and we feel that an institutional repository will fit that bill as a publicly available repository. Um, so I know Margaret Henty from ANS actually curated a, a list of journals some three years ago. I think that work was done. I agree very much with that statement that it is a massive job because of the numbers of scholarly journals that are out there. Um, I've actually attempted to update that as we work through the process of bringing our authors because I'm actually checking the data policy of journals before I go and I intend to hand that work back to ANS. Um, when, it will be in advance, it won't be complete. So in that case I have a project for you um, and the project is being run at the moment out of the UK. Um, just a show of hands, how many people have heard of the JORD, J-O-R-D project? Okay, all right, that's actually not bad. So the JORD project is essentially trying to do for data policies on journals what Sherpa Romeo did for institutional repository deposit policies. It's trying to pull together all of the journal policies for um, 
data deposition or data linkage. And uh, ANS is working with Jord on that particular activity. Uh, and if you're at all interested in trying to provide one space in the world that you can go to to find out does, what does this journal require for um, authors, Jord is probably the best candidate at the moment. All right, we're going to have to stop it there, I'm afraid. We're five minutes over time. Please join with me in thanking our two presenters in the second half.